All right, welcome. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Amber Stewart. I am the Vice President of the Black Law Students Association here at the University of Chicago Law School. I'm honored today to welcome and introduce our annual Earl B. Dickerson lecturer, Ms. Karen Freeman Wilson. Um, I hope you all will join me in welcoming her um, by throwing up some applause. So um, I will go ahead and introduce Ms. Wil Ms. Freeman Wilson. So Ms. Freeman Wilson is a lawyer, a former judge of the, Gar of the Gary City Court, the mayor, the former mayor of Gary, Indiana from 2012, 2019, and is currently the president and the CEO of the Chicago Urban League. Born and raised in Gary, Indiana, Ms. Freeman Wilson earned her BA from Harvard College and her JD from Harvard Law School in 1985. She returned to Gary in 1994 and began to serve her community as a city judge. In 2000, Governor Frank O'Banion, um, or Bannon, appointed Ms. Freeman Wilson as the Indiana At Attorney General. Ms. Freeman Wilson lost her reelection bid, but went on to become the CEO of the nonprofit National um, Association of Drug Court Professionals, an organization devoted to furthering the treatment court model and criminal justice reform worldwide. In 2011, Ms. Freeman Wilson ran for mayor of Ganey, Indiana and won by a landslide, carrying 87% of the vote. She became the city's first female mayor and, and to date is the only female mayor in Gary's 115 year history. While mayor, Ms. Freeman Wilson worked tirelessly for her city, battling against economic deficits, high crime rates, and a poor national image. Known for her honesty, integrity, and willingness to roll up her sleeves and work side by side, with the people she served, Ms. Freeman Wilson successfully decreased violent crime rates and attracted investors like Amazon and Alliance Steel to Gary during her, time, during her tenure as mayor. Although she lost her bid for a third term in 2019, Ms. Freeman Wilson left Gary in a better shape than how she found it. In January, 2020, she became the president and the CEO of the Chicago um, Urban League. I'll tell you, now I'll tell you a little bit about the Urban League itself. Organized in 1916, the Chicago Urban League works to achieve equity for Black families and communities through social and economic empowerment. Some of its programs include ensuring access to quality education, affordable housing, jobs, and entrepreneurship training. From 1939 to 1955, our very own Earl B. Dickerson himself served as the president of the Chicago Urban League. So it seems only fitting that this year's Earl, um, this year's Dickerson lecturer be a woman who, like Earl Dickerson, has spent her career working tirelessly to serve her community and to further civil rights, and who now holds the same office he once held. Please join me in welcoming our 2001 Earl B. Dickerson lecturer, President and CEO, Karen Freeman Wilson. Good afternoon, and Amber, thank you, uh, and the students of BALSA, as well as the faculty and staff of the University of Chicago for the invitation to join you for the Earl Dickerson, Earl B. Dickerson lecture. Uh, I want to also thank you for that gracious introduction. I'm a little afraid that it might be longer than my speech, but when you are such a job vagabond as I am, sometimes it's hard to keep it short. But uh, you humbled me with uh, your kind remarks during that introduction. And I am excited to join you today because Earl Dickerson was such a role model for me and for all of us who are not only lawyers, but who are fighters for justice as he was. He was a trailblazer in so many venues, uh, whether you look at his work in the corporate arena, whether you look at his work in the legal arena, whether you look at the initiatives that he fought for on behalf of the NAACP and certainly our own beloved Chicago Urban League. He was a consummate trailblazer, unless we not forget his efforts on behalf of the Divine Nine as a founding member of the beta chapter of Kappa Alpha, Alpha Psi fraternity. And um, all of the things that he done, did uh, here in Chicago and all over the country. And so 
I am excited to join you as the Earl, Dicker, Earl B. Dickerson lecturer. And when I thought about a subject that I never gave Amber, despite her efforts to get a subject from me, I thought about the subject that um, is near and dear to my heart these days as we think about the role that we all play in the realm of social justice. And, and that's really what I want to talk about. And that is that everyone on this call, and quite frankly, everyone, period, has a role to play in the social justice arena. What do I mean by that? Uh, because I know that everyone does not want to be a civil rights lawyer, nor can everyone be a civil rights lawyer. But notwithstanding that fact, I think we all have a role to play in the social justice arena. And I would dare say that we all have a responsibility given what we have seen over the last year and be uh, given even the challenges that we have seen in 2021. Certainly uh, during the course of my career, I have uh, prosecuted uh, as a deputy prosecutor. I have served um, at, at the Indiana Civil Rights Commission. As you've heard, I've served as Indiana Attorney General, but I have not always been directly engaged in the social justice arena. And so I think that I can speak with a, a fair amount of authority to say that even when you are not directly involved, even when you are not directly engaged in the fight for civil rights, there is something that you can do. Because when we think about social justice, when we talk about social justice, we're really talking about two things. And, and that's something that we engage in daily at the Chicago Urban League. The first is to uh, work towards dismantling structural or institutional racism. And the second is to take up the mantle of reducing the racial wealth gap. And whether you are in a corporate firm or big law as it's traditionally called, or in a traditional corporation whether you are at the University of Chicago, which is a well-respected uh, institution of higher learning, or whether you are in a community-based organization like the Chicago Urban League or in a, um, a nonprofit or a, a social law enterprise, there is a role that you can play in um, addressing social justice. And, you know, when I think about those roles, they are varied. Uh, sometimes it's volunteering on a nonprofit board. Sometimes it is trying to determine what your role is as one who is in the corporate arena, whether it's big law or whether it's a corporation, how those corporate policies impact um, society as a whole, or sometimes it's simply uh, being willing to provide pro bono legal service on behalf of community-based organizations or on behalf of individuals in the community who require your representation, who require your voice, who require your expertise. But there is something that we can all do, and I would argue there is something that we must all do in order to make a change. I think of our own Chicago Urban League and the work that we do on the day on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, one of the things that we do uh, is in the realm of leadership development. We have the IMPACT program, and some of you may have heard about that. And that program is directed at encouraging African American, uh, young African American leaders, both in their professional as well as in their personal development. And the thought is that as 
you move up the uh, ladder in the corporate arena, you're going to need uh, a variety of tools, a variety of networks, a variety of supports that will help you to be successful. But in addition to that, as you move up professionally, you also um, need to serve in the community. And sometimes that's on boards and commissions. Sometimes that's in your faith community. Sometimes that's in your sorority or fraternity. But through the Impact Leadership Program, we provide support, mentoring, coaching. Uh, we provide the exposure to folks who have gone before to make sure that we allow and um, encourage you as a emerging leader in the black community and the community at large with the tools that you need. In addition to that, we provide a support in the housing, employment, entrepreneurship, and educational arena for those who are um, in our service area, which is all of Chicago land, and for many who are not in our service area. So in housing, we focus on first time home buyers and we also focus on uh, foreclosure prevention as well as financial empowerment. In the entrepreneurship area, we focus on small businesses, thinking about the fact that those who employ less than 25 people um, are in our sweet spot to help them think about technology, marketing, uh, also to think about how they um, utilize procurement opportunities to scale their businesses. And then um, we also work with those who just have an idea. I think I want to start a business. So what do you need to do in order to start that business? In youth services, we not only work in the educational realm, most recently helping our uh, youth to get connected to uh, those who are in the Chicago public schools to get connected to internet and utilize devices to continue their education, but also to um, provide college, college scholarships and to provide uh, social and connecting opportunities to think about career development, to think about uh, those issues that are important to our youth, like police community relations, uh, surviving through COVID, understanding that this has been a new framework for young people and to help them to uh, talk about with their peers and with others, the subject matter, uh, the subjects that they are most inter interested in. Uh, we just held a gaming tournament because we know that uh, you can be inundated with Zoom and there ought to be an opportunity for fun and to uh, still to continue to attend movie premieres because that's what we did prior to COVID and we want them to continue to have access to those opportunities. And then in our workforce development, uh, to provide a spectrum of employment opportunities from entry level to uh, upper management for those who are looking to uh, get employed again or to get employed for the first time. In um, April of last year, we opened the COVID-19 Help Center because we understood that people would continually continue to come to us, but it might not just be in one area. And so when people come to us now for entrepreneurship or education or employment, we ask the extra, question, extra questions to find out if they have any needs in the other areas that we serve, but also we added health equity because we understand the importance, not just of health during COVID, but health equity during COVID. And then we also published the uh, publication COVID-19 uh, Addressing Institutional 
uh, or structural racism and COVID-19 in the black community. We published that in May of last year and it has been widely cited because we not only look at the health factors that have impacted people during COVID, but we look at environmental factors that have made it much more difficult to recover from COVID or to navigate the COVID environment in the Black community. Um, and so the Urban League has been busier than ever, but we are not complaining because we believe that over the course of our over 100 year history, we have been an institution that must rise to the occasion in the Black community uh, for Chicago. And um, we relish the opportunity to do that now and to continue to do that because we understand that we serve in a unique place. So with that, I'm going to stop running my mouth and uh, give uh, those of you who are on, uh, on this Zoom the opportunity to ask any questions that you have of me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so everyone, um, you know, business as usual, feel free to raise your hand and I'll, I can un unmute you or you can reveal yourself, turn on your camera and ask your question directly of our speaker. Or if you'd be more comfortable, feel free to inbox me your questions. I, I do have a list of questions to kind of get us started. If, if no one has one that comes top of mind, I can get the conversation started. Um, I, I did want to ask you some of these questions because um, I'm, I'm very curious. So uh, let's see. All right, I'll go ahead then. Um, so my first question is, could you please compare and contrast your work and experiences being mayor of Gary, Indiana and being CEO and president of the Chicago Urban League? Well, thank you. I, I love that question because um, first, let me say I love both um, opportunities. I, I've been extremely blessed during the course of my professional career to do some things that I really, really enjoy, really am passionate about. I will tell you that my greatest love is drug treatment court, so I hope I get to talk about that later. But what I always say about uh, the comparison between the city, city of Gary and the league is that I am continuing to do those things that I'm passionate about. I have always been passionate about fair housing, about employment opportunities, about creating uh, business or entrepreneurship opportunities and education and leadership development. But now I don't have to worry about potholes or snow or garbage. And so I feel like I have the best of both worlds. And I would also say that they both require um, bringing people together. And so the Urban League depends on uh, other community-based organizations as, as partners, the corporate community as partners, relationship with governmental entities as partners, and um, all of those together allow us to be effective. In the city, we did the same thing. Uh, while we were the governmental entity that would bring partners together, we depended on the corporate community, on community-based organizations, and on um, other go governmental entities at the state and federal level to become successful. And so I think that for probably all of my professional life, I've used the skill set of convening and, um, and bringing folks together for the service of a common constituency. And um, I think that's something that um, I've been able to do well and uh, something that I hope to employ all of my professional life. Awesome. That's great. And that actually leads perfectly into one of my next questions. You mentioned, you know, that the, the ability to contravene and bring together different constituencies is one, you know, or in the 
in the in in the service of your constituency is one skill that you have i actually wanted to know about a, another skill that you have so at so many points during your legal career your work has to me sat at the intersection of business and law um you know as i said earlier you got your jd from harvard law school but how did you gain the business skills and experience necessary to run a city budget and to now be the ceo of an organization like the chicago urban league well, I, I talked about um, how blessed I had been to have uh, multiple opportunities. And my first opportunity to um, really understand the importance of budgets and those who set budgets who may not be um, in your own office was with the Indiana Civil Rights Commission and as Indiana Attorney General. And so I learned to work with the members of the Indiana General Assembly. And then uh, through drug courts, uh, the National Association, I worked with board, a board. And um, I'm doing that again with the Urban League. And then, of course, as mayor, I worked with a council to set a budget. And so um, one of the things that I've done is learn while doing it in terms of learning to understand finance, learning to understand budgets. I did take a, a law and accounting course, but I would not say that it adequately prepared me for uh, managing through deficits and uh, really turning around institutions that have been faced with deficits as we've done at the city and as we've done at other places that I have been. But I, I think that really a lot of the basic skills are, are the same, and that's to understand how much money you have, understand um, what you need to do to manage within the confines of those dollars when you don't have enough money, and then to be able to work and understand where you might generate additional revenue. And, uh, and so that's been, and so I would say that in addition to the management of budgets, the additional skill is um, networking, uh, you know, because you really do have to um, work the net, as I like to call it, to bring all of the relationships to bear. And, you know, I used to think that I was going a securitist route. I knew that I always wanted to be mayor from the time that I was seven. And, you know, of course, starting off as a deputy prosecutor, I thought that my next step would be to run for council and then to run for mayor. Uh, I was not successful in my council run. And I ended up going and joining the by administration after uh, being a deputy prosecutor. And then I did something uh, as city court judge, and I thought then I would be mayor, but I didn't do that. I went to serve as attorney general and then went to Washington. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm getting way off track. But as that continued, I was able to ultimately um, uh, learn how to navigate uh, federal agencies in Washington, and then how to navigate the state of Indiana. And ultimately, all of that came to bear on my service as mayor. And so it's, a, a, you know, sort of all of those opportunities coming together, I think, to help me serve better. And even now, uh, even though I'm in Illinois and not managing the Indiana General Assembly, because I understand how general assemblies work, I think it will uh, and has made me more effective with the Urban League and the relationships that I was able to develop as mayor are all coming to bear because so many of the people that I've encountered with the league, I first encountered as mayor. That's great. And I, it sounds as if you, you know, some of it was also just, you know, learning by doing and learning on the job and, you know, kind of learning from those experiences that you found yourself in and that you achieved, I should say. There has been a lot of on the job training and that's something that I would say to you all as um, you know, law students soon to be working in your own professional careers. Don't be afraid of new opportunities. I, I left um, 
And this was shortly after I finished law school when I was um, going to the um, Indiana Civil Rights Commission. I had no clue what they did. I mean, other than what I had learned in a library book uh, the day before the interview, but I was willing to take on the challenge because I thought that my legal education prepared me to uh, serve in that role and, and do well. And it did. Jumping off of that, can you speak to, because you mentioned it, um, and I do want to hear about that as well. I think we all do. Could you speak about your time in the drug courts and your time as serving as the city judge? And, you know, I mean, you know, when you said, you know, at seven, you knew you wanted to be a mayor. At seven, did you also want to be a judge? Like, how did you, you know, get to that point? Um, I didn't. I mean, you know, I, the and it, it's, it goes to show you a lot about what you're and who you're exposed to. And so at seven, I was exposed to candidate Richard Gordon Hatcher, who ultimately became mayor, Richard Gordon Hatcher. And when I listened to him as a seven-year-old, I was convinced that that was something that I would like to do for my city. And even as a little girl could do, um, you know, because my parents were always uh, instilling in me the fact that if I studied hard, if I worked hard, I could be anything that I wanted to be. Um, and so having that experience and then um, having the opportunity to fulfill the city judge's unexpired term and to see very quickly uh, people coming in and out of the court uh, using the revolving door of justice and understanding that they weren't just liking the hospitality at the city jail, but that they were addicted to alcohol or other drugs and understanding the chronic nature of the problem. And then learning early on in my tenure as a judge about drug treatment courts and saying, this is something that we really need in Gary, Indiana. And I was able to see it firsthand on a family vacation. And you can imagine my husband's face when I said, hey, you know, I know we're on vacation, but I'm just going to run down the street to the court. I'll be right back in an hour. And three hours later, um, after seeing how drug treatment court worked, how people's lives were being transformed, even seeing that the um, judge at the time picked up the phone. We were interviewing someone who had just graduated from drug court and they um, said, and he said, well, don't you have experience as a uh, clerk, a grocery clerk? And she said, yes. He said, well, let me call somebody. And he called the head of one of the largest uh, grocery store chains in California and said, I have someone who just finished our court. Would you give her an opportunity? And I'm like, wait a minute, this woman just said that she's been using drugs for 14 years, but the judge just called and got her a job. This must be something that is truly transformational. I want to have this in Gary and went back and became immediately an ambassador for drug courts. That was in, I think, gee, 19, um, I think it was in 89, no, it was 1994. And I've been an ambassador for drug courts in some capacity ever since then. And uh, I will tell you, as one who has seen the criminal justice system for, from every uh, side, as a public defender, as a prosecutor, as a private attorney, as a judge, it is one of the most transformational uh, initiatives to uh, hit the justice system that I have seen. And, you know, I still serve as vice chair of the board of the organization that I led in Washington, and it is an honor to be able to continue to work in that field. That's wonderful. Um, and I, I 
I have a few questions that have come in through the chat, so I'll go ahead with one of those. Um, so someone wanted to know, um, can you speak to the working relationship you have with the Chicago City Council or the mayor's office in your capacity as the CEO of the Chicago Urban League? Um, like, for example, do you partner with them to get certain initiatives or certain programs done or not? So we have a working relationship with both uh, the mayor's office as well as our own uh, alter, alder person uh, or alderman, they say alderman uh, Pat Dow. And uh, that is largely a function of getting information out, making sure that we get as much information to the citizens of this community as possible. Uh, we want to make sure that people have access to our programs, to the uh, grants, to things that we have. In addition to that, we worked very early on. The mayor understood the limitations of uh, PPP, her, she and her team. And so very early on, they did a micro grant program. We were one of the agencies to administer that micro grant program. And then they came back and did a larger uh, grant program, and we were one of the agencies that administered that. Uh, we also do uh, business coaching, business mentoring through a partnership that we have with the city, and then we also provided uh, rent vouchers for people who are being evicted through a program that um, the city of Chicago did. So a lot of our COVID uh, relief work has been done in partnership, not just with the mayor's office, but also with the um, state, as well as with the county. And we continue to do work with the county. But there are times that, you know, we have to say, we want to receive answers about things that are being done. Uh, we did that through the um, rally that we staged with other community-based organizations outside of the pro pro uh, police precinct involving uh, the treatment of Ms. Ajanat Young. Uh, we continue to do that around police accountability. And here's what I would say, and, and I know this uh, from my experience as a mayor, I will always work with elected officials on those areas that we agree on. And I believe that um, we it's our duty and responsibility to call for accountability in those areas where we uh, take issue with elected officials, and that includes the mayor. But you know, I know also that I'm uniquely situated because I understand the um, choices and the difficult choices that the mayor and other elected officials face on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's easy for us to sit at home or sit in our offices and say, you should do this or you should do that, not having the full picture. Another question that came through, um, someone wanted to ask, what area of equity suffered the most during COVID, during COVID and will need the most pressing attention when COVID ends, whenever that is? Um, and what actions do you think um, we as law students and future lawyers can take to help with this specifically? You know, um, I would say that education suffered the most. And I remember sitting in our conference room on the 12th when we were trying to decide uh, when to close the office, it wasn't whether we knew that it was when. And of course, that decision was made to close the next day. But I remember saying, you know, um, you know, we were all concerned about health issues and we were we knew that there would be a challenge relative to health. But I knew that education would suffer the most because there are so many inherent inequities. And so I think that uh, we've seen that happen. There has been learning loss uh, throughout this area, both with CPS schools and other schools. And, um, and so while, you know, I think it's more likely that undergraduates will tutor 
than law students to the extent that you as a law student can get involved in educational equity by volunteering in a variety of capacities or if you're willing to tutor. Uh, I think that that's going to be so important. And then, um, and then the other area, I would say health equity. We are seeing that certainly with COVID testing. We are seeing that now with the vaccine and with access to treatment. You know, the idea of closing a hospital in the midst of a pandemic is just unconscionable. Yet we've seen that threatened and we've seen that happen. And so to the extent that you have an interest in health equity, I would also encourage you to be involved. But, um, you know, as law students and as professionals, you will always have a choice where you volunteer. And any aspect of educational or health equity uh, could certainly use your knowledge and your expertise. Thank you. That that's that's great. Um, and I think it's also, you know, I think it's it's also very very timely because for for a lot of us, you know, we as law students, we're we're used to being able to do pro bono clinics or things in the community, and so you know, tutoring to the extent that you know students or anyone has access to a computer, tutoring is something that we can that we can do and you know feel useful doing um, from home. So that that's helpful. The other thing that I would raise, and it's not an issue now, but I would say probably in the next three, three to six months, it will be, and that's um, advice on foreclosure. You know, certainly we have that center, but uh, just helping people to navigate which, what we know to be, you know, a very difficult terrain, even though there are uh, grace periods and um, there have been moratoriums, those moratoriums will come off eventually. And while the mortgage company, I don't think has a real interest in just foreclosing on properties in mass, folks will need help navigating what can be very difficult to read, difficult to understand uh, contracts. Yeah. Um, I just had another question come through the chat. I think this is a great one. So um, someone wants um, you to speak a little bit about what it was like to go to Harvard Law School in the 1980s as a Black woman um, and, and as someone from the state of Indiana, which must have been uncommon in your class. Um, and, you know, or even, you know, thinking back, back to the fact that you also went to Harvard, um, Harvard College, what was that like, that whole period? So what I will tell you is that I had a bridge from Harvard College to Harvard Law School, and that bridge made a difference for me. In fact, I will tell you this little known secret. My first choice was University of Chicago. I was ready to come home, but Harvard admitted me uh, readily and University of Chicago waitlisted me. So I said, well, you know, I'm here, I might as well stay. But in 1978, when I arrived on uh, Harvard's campus, I was shocked. I mean, I left Gary, went to Cambridge. You know, I had a roommate who rode crew. I had to look it up. I had no clue of what I was getting into. And the um, interesting part was that I had actually uh, accepted a spot at General Motors Institute only to go to the Bedford Foundry for all of two days and determine that was not for me and to have to scramble in the middle of the summer before my freshman year to get to Harvard. And so my father was furious that I had started something and not finished. And so I knew that even though I was terribly homesick, when I got to Cambridge, I had to stay. And so what I did was found my group. You know, whenever you go to a, into a new situation, you really do have to find your comfort uh, zone, your crew, your, your family. And my family was initially the basketball team because I was on the junior varsity basketball team 
had an injury my uh, sophomore year and joined the Kuumba Singers of Harvard and Radcliffe Colleges. And that is my family to this day. And then uh, we chartered a Delta chapter at Harvard my sophomore year. In fact, uh, Loretta Lynch and I are line sisters. And uh, so that was my family and, and they continue to be my family to this day. But it was uh, really, the academics weren't difficult, but just the different culture and understanding and navigating uh, a different culture. Um, you talk about culture shock. I could have written a book on that. That's, yeah, that that's great. I had a similar experience when I went to undergrad for the first time. So I can, I can definitely relate. Yeah. Um, I thought I heard someone, someone else speak. Feel free to unmute. And these are great questions, everyone. So you should feel free to, you know, um, unmute and show yourself so you can ask directly because I feel like I'm taking credit for these great questions. Yeah. Um, okay, so relatedly, um, back to some of the questions I, I prepared. Um, how has being a Black woman impacted your career, your leadership style, and your day-to-day -day experiences in the various roles you have held? I think being a Black woman uh, makes me less likely to see every challenge as a zero-sum game. I'm always looking for the win-win, and it has informed um, my leadership style. I'm a consensus builder. Uh, even as a judge, I think that's why I was so um, moved toward the drug court movement because I understood how collaborative it is and it's made me much more collaborative. I, I think that um, even uh, when I've encountered situations because, you know, as, a, as Black women, we do encounter those situations where people challenge your authority, where uh, you say something in a room uh, where they're largely men and, and many times largely white men, you will make a suggestion, you will come up with a solution and uh, that is passed over. And then one of the men in the room say the same thing you said. And they say, oh, that's a great idea. Makes, you know, I've been less likely to say, well, I, I just said that. Um, or I may say it and I say it in a different way and I'm less likely to take offense to uh, situations as a Black woman, which makes it easier to solve problems. So I think that um, being a Black woman makes me a better problem solver, and it certainly makes me a better multitasker. Over the course of the weekend, I got behind, so I had to wash six loads of clothes. Uh, and I dare say that most of my male counterparts didn't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being candid and, and, and cause it's hard sometimes to talk, to answer questions like that. So I appreciate sure, it. Sure. No, I'm glad to do it. And, and, you know, I, I would say, uh, one of the things that I've thought a lot about, I have a daughter who, um, I'm hoping is on her way to the hospital, uh, to the, uh, airport in the next room from the next room, because, uh, she is a, second year law student at Boston College. And she was here uh, from for my unveiling and, and is flying out of Midway today. But, you know, often I had to juggle being a mom and, uh, you know, wanting to be present because I did have jobs that required me to travel a lot. And at some point I just made a decision that uh, she would travel with me for the exposure and for the ability to spend more time with her rather than uh, lose that time. And while she might not be the best math student, I think she's much more well-rounded because of her experience with me as a mom. So switching a little bit, um, I wanted to talk about the two communities that you serve, um, Gary, or you serve and have served. So Gary in Chicago, um, you know, they both have fraught reputations and, you know, poor repu sometimes poor reputations around the country. You know, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you, how did you, and how do you confront those reputations 
um, in your, you know, in your, in your day-to-day life as mayor, but then now as the president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League? You know, um, I think that there have been challenges both in Gary and Chicago uh, with fraud, uh, both actual and perceived. And so what I've worked really hard to do is to operate wherever I've gone, uh, both in a public and private capacity with integrity. And, um, you know, inevitably there are people who will look at you a certain way simply because you serve in a certain place. But, you know, I've always invited folks to uh, peel back the layers of the onion. You know, if you need to do an investigation, do it. If you need to look into something, do it, because um, there are folks who have not been as transparent and as honest. And then uh, for those who are, that requires uh, us to be willing to undergo the extra scrutiny because of people who have not who have served in the same or similar capacities. And I think you just have to be willing to um, hold yourself to a higher standard and to hold others to a higher standard. Um, I also think that people should not always be quick to believe the worst about people, even though there have been others who have gone before who have done things that have not been the best. So I, I think both are important. Building on that, as mayor, you did such great work to revitalize Gary, but unfortunately, sometimes your economic gains were overshadowed by the city's crime rate and blight. How did you persevere and continue your work despite the ne- negative attention? So, you know, I, and I would remember one instance where we were really making progress and then Darren Van shows up. <laughs> literally kills five women in Garrett. And I'm like, you know, how does that happen? Um, But what I understood was that um, it's not just one area, it's all areas. And we had to work on many of those things at the same time. And I also understood that we would not necessarily get credit for the work that we were doing uh, while we were doing it, that it would be two years or five years when you would see that work come into um, into the reality and and you know get get uh, the accolades or get the recognition and uh, you know two examples that I would will give you is the development that is currently occurring at the Gary Airport. We planned it for UPS to go to the Gary Airport. We planned that for the development that is occurring and the demolition that's occurring up and down Broadway. That was our plan. Uh, The new companies that have opened in the last year, we laid the groundwork, but I don't mind someone else cutting the ribbon for that work because at the end of the day, I knew that it would not necessarily always happen on during my tenure, that it would happen two years, five years, 10 years after my tenure. And it was never my intention to serve as mayor forever. Now, I didn't intend on losing an election, don't get me wrong, but, you know, in my plan and, you know, I, I've lived long enough to understand the difference between my planning and God's planning. But my plan was that I would serve two years of this third term and be able to handpick my successor. God had another plan, um, you know, because the reality was that I was working literally from about six in the morning until 10 at night. That was not sustainable. You know, I would have fallen flat on my face at some point during that third term. And it might have been prior to me uh, necessarily saying, "Okay, I give. And so God's like, no, you you do something different 
similar but different and we're going to take let me take care of the rest of this and and you know i couldn't be happier I, you know nobody rejoices at losing anything i'm competitive if i'm nothing else but i will tell you i am in a much better place and am so grateful to be here and to be able to continue uh, similar work but different and i still you know um you said working in both communities i do uh, because i've not been able to move yet because of COVID. i'm looking forward to being able to move because sometimes you know uh, about a month ago i was sitting in at home it was about 10 30 somebody knocks at my door says hey mayor uh, can you give me some money to go up to mcdonald's and i'm like really at 10 o'clock at night um, so, you know, I can't wait to get over here and, and get some kind of residential anonymity, if nothing else. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's great. Um, and I, you know, and I, what you said about, you know, not liking to lose, being competitive and kind of having to, you know, grapple with that and, and finding the lemonade out of the lemons in that situation, I think is just so wonderful and so applicable to, to myself as a law student. And I would, you know, I don't want to speak for my peers, but I think for people, you know, in our line of work or who are studying or who are being lawyers or who have, you know, reached the position in our lives where we're at institutions like UChicago, Harvard, Boston Law, that, you know, finding the, the silver lining and loss is definitely challenging so thank you for you know speaking on that because i think that's definitely an for me anyway it's a definitely an important lesson and something to remember yeah i you know it's it's absolutely something to remember at, at this point in my life i have lost more elections than i have won and notwithstanding that i have been uh extremely blessed by a measure of success and i've learned from not just the wins, but I think I've learned more from the losses. I, I lost twice before I was successful the third time as mayor. And, you know, I had, the, during that first and second campaign, I was just telling folks about all my experience and all my knowledge, knowledge and how smart I was and all the uh, people I knew and all the connections I had. And it wasn't until my mother had her fifth and sixth strokes and I became a caregiver in my home that I began to understand the importance of compassion towards people. I, you know, I'd like to think that I was always compassionate, but when you are literally uh, changing diapers and navigating healthcare and hearing uh, from home health workers who have their own set of challenge, challenges, it makes you even more compassionate and helps you understand what compassion really, really means. And I had pretty much decided I'm not going to run again. But folks said, no, no, we, we think this is your time. And, and the third time ended up being the charm. Uh, but, you know, it was from losing or at least from being challenged and going through those challenges that I really understood uh, what was important in life. That's critical. Um, and earlier you mentioned um, Richard Gordon Hatcher, and I wanted to talk a little bit about him because I know that he was, you know, one of your your hero. Um, he was, for those of you who don't know, he was the first black mayor in the United States, um, along with Carl Stokes of Cleveland. Um, and so, you know, he once told you, you know, there's life after being mayor. And I want to ask, <laughs> how have his words rung true for you? He is absolutely right. Um, and he told me that during a time where he was being celebrated and we were honored to celebrate him with a statue. Um, you know, not only is there life after being mayor, you get your life back after being mayor. Um, a lot of times, uh, and it's very humbling and an honor that a lot of my colleagues who have difficult challenges will call me and um, you know that's a, a oath that we uh, have always taken to be available whenever another mayor calls whether you are currently a mayor or formerly a mayor and you know there have been times when they've called and i was like oh yeah call me you know it's a saturday evening i'll be at home all night and they are like what 
I was like, yeah, I don't have anywhere to go today. And, you know, I kind of rub it in a little, but they will always say, I am jealous because um, there are times, you know, not only did I do that day from six in the morning to 10 at night, but I would do it on Saturdays too. Maybe it was nine on Saturdays, but it went from nine to about four. I'd go home and change clothes and then do from six until 11 or 12 on Saturdays because there was generally some type of social event or multiple social events and you try to make them all. Uh, so, um, you know, to have uh, Mayor Hatcher affirm that to me and then to be able to live that affirmation uh, is really uh, something that I have enjoyed. And it's allowed me to get back active with the Deltas and get back active with my church. And, you know, uh, I've always been a, a go-to for my family. And so, you know, although I'm trying to get them to understand, and this is my mother's brothers and sisters and my cousins, that just because I'm working from home does not mean that I am not working <laughs> because, you know, they'll call and say, hey, can you run over here and do this? Or it's like, no, not right now. But when I finish, it's like, well, are you still working from home? Yes, but the operative word is work. I I can I can totally absolutely relate. Um, my mom always calls me in the middle of the day because she knows I'm home. And I'm like, mom, I still have class. You know, I'm still I'm still on call in class. The professor's exactly. gonna call on me, please. You know. Um, all right. So we are about eight minutes away from closing. I just wanted to open up the floor again to anyone in the audience who might have a question for. Um, you know, President and CEO Freeman Wilson. If not, then I, you know, I do have more questions, but I just wanted to give um, you all one more opportunity before we ended. So I will finish up with the last few questions that I had. So um, people often say legal careers are long. Looking at your career, this is undoubtedly true. Um, and it's become truer over the course of this conversation as you describe even more jobs that you've held besides the ones that I just mentioned in my intro. So my question is, how have you transitioned from these various roles and offices you held throughout your life? What was that, you know, that, I guess, the learning curve from, from role to role like? So one of the things that I would say that I wish I'd known when I was in law school, or I, I kind of knew it, but I wish that my parents had um, given me the freedom to understand it, uh, as much freedom as I've given to my daughter, is that you don't have to uh, practice traditional law to utilize your legal education. You know, my father and mother were very traditional. They wanted me to go to law school and join a firm or hang up a shingle. And I did that. I did both. Uh, well, I joined the prosecutor's office. I actually didn't. I, I clerked for a couple of firms downtown uh, Chicago and just um, decided that that was not for me, but I went to the prosecutor's office. I ultimately opened a private practice. And while I enjoyed it, I uh, would have probably enjoyed my legal career more had I had that freedom uh, or that understanding. And I've said to my daughter, um, I think you should go to law school if that's what you really want to do. But I also think you should understand that the legal education is a tool that will help you in whatever area that you choose. And I think that's ultimately how I've been helped in my transitions, uh, in my transition from position to position. You know, as civil rights director, I didn't practice law, but there was a team of lawyers who were on our staff, and, um, and, and I worked very closely with them. As AG, um, I didn't, well, I did practice a bit. I argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, but that wasn't my primary role in the AG's office. And even in arguing before the Supreme Court, I had enough sense to say, I'll sit second chair you do the primary argument. 
Um, and, you know, the same was true with drug treatment courts, even as a judge. Uh, and even now, uh, in my role with the Urban League, I have utilized my legal education, but um, I have also understood when it's important to hire, as I call them, real lawyers. And so I would say that my legal training has made me a good utility player, particularly in leading nonprofits. And so it's, I think, made me that much more attractive as a candidate. But um, it has also helped me to understand that practicing law is not the only thing that um, I can do. But, you know, there's nothing like uh, operating in a courtroom and representing uh, and, and presenting a case to a jury or to a judge. I think I will always enjoy it. Uh, I just won't always do it. And so I'm glad to say when people call me, I'm sorry, I'm not practicing law every, anymore actively, but I keep my license up. So I still have an active license in the state of Indiana. Awesome. And um, that's perfect. And that kind of leads to my last question. Um, so for students who are thinking about running for political office, what advice would you have for them? And I guess to even broaden it, what advice do you have for students generally as we, you know, at least for me, as I'm looking at, you know, finishing my last law, year of law school and then transitioning into the legal sphere? What advice do you have for all of us to close? I would um, say two things. Um, if you are interested in uh, public service and particularly in elect elected public service, uh, know why you are interested in that. Uh, because I would not sit here and tell you that it's easy. Um, increasingly, it is a difficult area to be engaged in whether you're running or whether you're serving because um, you know you're accessible now that's good when you want to serve and and when you want to be as available to the public as possible but it is extremely challenging because people can be very mean-spirited and so if you are running to see your name up in lights you better you just buy a billboard uh, and just put your name there because, um, you know, inevitably you will see your name up in lights, but you will also become a target. And I, I would sort of transition that advice into whatever uh, you decide to do as uh, law students. You have to know while you're doing it. If you want to go into big law for the money, uh, you will be miserable because you will have money. But um, if you don't find the fulfillment and the work and in the actual practice, it will be a challenge. If you want to practice in the public service realm, um, just to say that, you know, I'm a public service lawyer, eh, that might be a challenge. So find those areas, find those things that drive, drive your passion. And I will say that that might not be the opportunity that you have first. So you might not be passionate about the first opportunity, but if you continue to hone your skills, if you continue to be the best that you can be, that next opportunity or that subsequent opp opportunity will be the one that will allow you to um, drive your passion and that will allow all of the things that you're interested in to come together. And a lot of times it's uh, where you're volunteering that you will ultimately find that professional opportunity that will drive your career. And, um, and you know what, don't be afraid of failure because um, it will happen, it happens to all of us. It's a matter of how you define your failure. I've always defined failure as a challenge for me. And um, even when it has been on the public stage, uh, but you know, look at it as a challenge 
and you can use it as a springboard to your next success. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Everyone, if you could please uh, once again join me in thanking our wonderful lecturer today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having and Freeman me. Freeman Wilson, such a great conversation. We really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I, you know, I wish you the best of luck. I look forward to seeing everything that the Chicago Urban League um, achieves. And I, you know, there's opportunities for all of us to get involved. I believe you all are having a webinar this evening. Um, so we are, we are, and would welcome you to it. It's Shy UL 101. It's really an opportunity to uh, learn about the league, what we do, and what we're engaged in. Um, and we're calling it Shy UL 101. Perfect. Yep. So if you're interested, you all, please go and join that. Um, but yes, thank you so much, um, Ms. Freeman Wilson. And I hope to see you again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Happy Black History Month. Thanks for the uh, invitation and opportunity. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much.